the world might feel a bit more chaotic and a bit more divided. It's easy to forget sometimes that there are constants. Your home's still your home, your family's still your family, and all the structures of our society are still there to look after you if you need it. Here we go. George's resource. Adult male, code red trauma, 10 minutes. Activate the helipad. There's been an explosion on a building site. Part red 200. Open your eyes, open your eyes. Imagine having to work here. Hello, Amy, can I help? St George's, London. It's all going to kick off now. One of Britain's busiest A&E departments. Are we ready to roll? We'll carry on CPI. Oh, goodness me, it's all happening, isn't it? We need to fix that or you won't survive. Who's it? Uh... A place where life... Would you say I was fit, Doctor? Honestly, I think I'm quite fit. Love. You are my everything. I love you, and it's OK. And loss. Oh, Mum. I'm so sorry. Unfold every single day. For every bad thing that you see, there is something equally wonderful out there. Oh. Filmed across one 24-hour period, these are the stories of a nation and its health service. I thought I was going to die. You're definitely not going to die. You've got too many good doctors and nurses here. When people experience really significant illness or injuries, we see people pull together, we see relationships get stronger, and we see people reflect on what really is the most important things in their life. Whatever happens, it's going to be OK. I love you. Love you too. It's a bank holiday afternoon. Warm today with some sunny spells and light winds, staying dry with highs of 23 degrees. In a summer bank holiday, the sun is shining, people are often out doing more activities, maybe having a barbecue, having friends round, having drinks, enjoying the sunshine. It can be different to a normal day in the emergency department because these bank holiday weekend activities can sometimes end in disaster. It's a sad, sad day. Why? Because it's bank holiday weekend and people just need to not be here. Yeah. If you're an emergency physician, you've got to be prepared for a busy day. Any accident can happen at any time. And we, we see those patients when they're coming through the door. Hello, St George's ED. Pedestrian, hit by van, 25 miles an hour, Bunzai windscreen. 12 minutes. Thank you. A 40-year-old man is being rushed to St George's. There's been an accident in Worcester Park. A man in his 40s appears to have been hit by a car in Central Road. The driver stopped at the scene and no arrests have been made. There's no word yet on the pedestrian's injuries. Adult male, trauma call, 12 minutes. The man's wife is en route to the hospital. It was a lovely sunny day. I've had a phone call from Mark. He said he's going to the pub for a drink. He said, oh, I'm just going to stay for a couple and I'll come back home. Then I had a phone call from the pub owner. He said, Mark, we went to get his friends. And they could hear this bang. Mark was hit by a car. They could see him flying in the air. It was horrendous. The new one coming in is a 42-year-old pedestrian hit by van. On shift today is consultant Phil. How long is that patient going to be? Uh, that was five minutes. Five minutes. Humans are not designed to be impacted by metal vehicles. 25 miles an hour. The speed of the vehicle that hits the pedestrian is very important. Anything above 20 miles an hour, that patient might have severe injuries. It's important to know where the main velocity of that impact has gone. 
So whether that has happened to the head, whether they've bullseyed the windscreen, whether the patient has gone over the top of the vehicle, you can get injuries to the pelvis, to the bones. We'd also worry about their thorax. The amount of injuries, it's infinite really. He's 42 years old. Mark's been hit by a van going approximately 25 miles per hour. He has been thrown up onto the windscreen and pulls out the windscreen. Absolutely. Mark doesn't remember the event itself. There's been a lot of repetitive questioning with him. Um, he was at the pub at four, so he's had two beers, but nothing more than that. Thank you very much. Let me do primary, that'd be awesome, please. Memory loss from an impact to the head would be a red flag for a severe head injury. So if we take off your side first, ready, steady, brace. It could cause anything from a change in personality, a problem with your arms and legs, or a worst case scenario, bleed on the brain. We just want to work out if there's any other injuries, given the mechanism. I couldn't bring myself to say to the girls what's happened. Mark's mum said to them, oh, your daddy, was involved in an accident. And we go into hospital. I couldn't believe it, that something like this is happening. I was really, really worried. I thought I would never see him again. And the children are so small and they will grow up without a dad. There's like a big seven seat people carry on. Oh, okay. Thanks. He landed about 15 feet from where he was. Doctors are concerned that 40 year old Mark may have suffered severe injuries to his head after being hit by a car. Hi, Mark. I'm going to take you around to CT, okay? Mark's daughters, wife, and mother have now arrived in recess. They're still waiting for the scan back. Mm. So they, they need, do you need toilet, darling? You all right? Do you want toilet, sweetheart? She dies, she's bursting. Do you want to take her to toilet? It'll be sunny, you don't remember anything. Mm. Mm. Mark was always a happy child, always smiling, and people called him Smiler. He didn't have a lot of problems until he was grown up. Right, ready, steady, slow. Brilliant. So we start off by scanning your head and your neck, and then we do the rest of your body. He had a pair of football boots on him from the age of three. Never wanted to have a pencil in his hand or do colouring or drawing or anything like that. He lived and dreamt football. Brilliant. Just keep nice and still. It won't take too long. He was influenced by his father. He was a, a sports teacher, and he also played top-class amateur football. He even played at Wembley. Breathe in and hold your breath. Mark could play with both feet. At the age of six, he was playing in a little football team and um, he stood out then. He then went on to Tottenham right up until he was 14. His dream was always to be a professional footballer. Stress him right up above your head. It was his father's wish for him to go to Arden Lyle Boarding School. Said it would be a great opportunity to make that dream come true for him. It was a beautiful place. The football pitch was like a bowling green. They offered these sports scholarships, and Mark happened to get one. That was the only way he could have gone. It was very new to us, boarding school, because nobody else in the family had ever gone. 
he was there actually with a, a prince from Italy. His father was thrilled. My best memory of Mark playing football was actually going to Eton. He was the captain that day, scored against Eton as well. And then afterwards, the boys, they went off to teas and the parents all went for teas. And we literally, we did have cucumber sandwiches. So it was very nice. I'm basically how the other half live. Well done, that's all finished. So the doctors will look at that scan now. His father's dream was to become a professional footballer himself. And in his own mind, he felt that Mark might have got that chance that he missed out on. But nine times out of 10, it's not possible to live that dream through your child. I'll grab another blanket for you, OK? I couldn't sleep very well because it was so hot. Is that one of those um, half sleeps? It's just like no air flow in here, is it? Oh, that's the thing. Guys, Chris, have I got a sweat patch on my back? Yeah, it's massive. Is it? No, it's fine. No, you, you're, you're fine. You, just, you, you look ridiculous. Can you please not be here with that sunburn? It's put me off. You're the same colour as Christine's tunic. I only want it for a little while and then I'm, uh, I'm OK. Up my sleeves. Now, what is this? It's a horse. Oh, well, I think it's a donkey, actually. Three-year-old Diego is in St George's with his parents after having a seizure at nursery. But then you need to walk with this, like jumping and move towards. Come on. Yeah, that's it. That's the one. Oh, accident. I'm from the south of Spain. The city is called Linares. It's an awesome place. I think it was one of my favorite places in, uh, in Spain. As a child, I was a really curious guy. I couldn't keep my mouth shut all the time talking. I loved to read and uh, discuss that with my father. I used to, like, you know, kill him with questions all the time. This is a uh, triceratops. It's a dinosaur. They used to pay me to keep my mouth shut in the car because I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't stop talking. So they used to pay me 10 pesetas, which is like 60p or something like that, for keeping my shop for an hour, just silent for an hour. <laughs> Good boy. I really admire my father. I think he's like, um, he's like a really intelligent person, smart person, capable. He always told me you need to be hard worker always, always tell the truth. Many of the times I was just like, I wanted to just learn about uh, all the stuff he was saying. Diego. Hello. Hi there. There we go. So my name is Alex, I'm one of the doctors here. Nice to Hi, meet Alex. you both. In terms of the, the seizure itself, did they tell you at all? Whether they describe to you what happened at all? So basically, the, the teacher told me that he took a seat yeah. and uh, he saw him like shaking. shaking. At the beginning, he thought she thought it was like uh, he was playing. Yes. But, but then, then they realized it was uh, like a okay. convulsion. Yeah? So just arms and shaking. And they put on the, on the like uh, recovery position. Recovery position. Oh. Yeah. And they called the ambulance straight away. Fine. When I was a kid, I was like like lawyer films on TV. I was just picture myself in the middle of the court in the room, like, you know, with my pointing finger like this, <laughs> shouting uh, to, the jury, to the jury and explaining everything to them. So what we need to do is if we pop Diego into the bed, pop him on the bed and we'll have a good look at him and we'll go from there. My father really motivated me. I studied at university four or five years and now I have a degree in law. So yeah, and then, and, you know, I start working as a lawyer. There we go. Yeah. So it's a little bit sore, yeah. So it's, yeah, a bit, it's a bit red and a bit sore. Yeah. With a degree in law, you could do a lot of stuff. 
but then circumstances and life just change and you can always follow your plan. Stick your tongue out for me. Thank you, boy. That's it. Yeah. All Sorry, done. Mate. That's all right. No worries at all. All done. Looking at him head to toe, tonsils are quite big. Okay. They're red and big, but they're not doing look particularly infected. Okay. Ears, right, the right ear looks a bit red and a bit sore. We need to get a urine sample before he goes as yeah. well. Just, it doesn't sound like a water infection, but that's something that we should definitely okay. rule out before he goes. Okay. No girls wore shorts last year. Only the lads. Just ridiculous, though, shorts and scrubs. I did it for a day and I couldn't take myself seriously, so I was thinking, how could anyone else? Hello, St George's ED. So, partial amputation to right foot. Yeah. Yeah, so big toe and the bits of the three toes next to it. Thanks, bye. A 56-year-old man is being rushed to St George's after slicing off his toes whilst gardening. Adult male trauma call, four minutes. Toes are very complex. So if someone loses a digit, no matter how it looks, it's important that digit is brought to the hospital. Only then can we investigate that appendage to see if it's re-implantable. Yeah, just to give you a heads up, we've got a trauma call coming in that is um, partial amputation of foot. Big toe and bits of the three toes next to it. At the time of the accident, the man was alone in his back garden. It was a beautiful, beautiful bank holiday morning. The plan was to mow the grass. You see on the television all these wonderful football pitches with the lines going up and down, and that's how I want my lawn to look. To achieve that, it means moving a few things out of the way in the garden. I'd forgotten I'd moved a pot plant. I fell backwards over the pot plant. The lawnmower has come up with me, but then the force of gravity has brought it back down again, just as my right foot's gone straight up into the blades. There was cartilage sticking out, there was bits of bone, you know, it was, it, it was a mess. I've called my son when he arrived. It was a bit like a cartoon, you know, when um, eyes pop out on springs. John is a 56-year-old male. He has suffered a partial amputation to the big toe on the right foot yep. and the other three consecutive toes. Uh, we do have them in saline. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, sir, it's going to sound a bit odd, but obviously we're going to just, make, just cover you from head to toe. We just need to make sure we're not missing anything else first, OK? Yep. So we're just going to move you across a little bit, and then my colleagues are just going to have a look at you, OK? The quicker that a patient arrives and we get the plastic surgical team in, involved, the more likely they are to be able to reattach that digit. And that would require an operation with microscopes to reattach the blood vessels and the nerves. We're going to have a look, sir. Yeah. Toes are important because they help us to mobilise, help us to walk. Our foot works as a kind of tripod made up of the, the heel, the first toe, uh, and, and the fifth toe. If that tripod is disturbed in any way, it can have far-reaching consequences. So, sir, I think look where you've taken your toe off, you've taken the end of your big toe off. Yeah. I'm not a plastic surgeon, yeah. but generally when it's right at the end, they, they won't re-implant anything, and they just terminalise it. What do you mean by terminal? As in, they'll, they'll get some skin from elsewhere and put it over the end. But what we're going to do is get a plastic surgeon to come down and see you. So I'm going to give you one of the injections now. Yeah. And then one when it comes up from pharmacy. 
56-year-old John is waiting for plastic surgeons to decide if they can reattach any of his toes. I'm going to give you some uh, tetanus shot. OK. Thank you. When I was a child, I used to watch a lot of football. I lived and breathed it. In the late 80s, I got a job as a roving reporter, and they were fun times. I was like a, a kid in a sweet shop. I interviewed David Beckham, Roy Keane, Andy Cole, Dwight York, Thierry Henry. I've been very lucky. I've, been, you know, I've seen some fantastic places and met some brilliant people. Sorry, my dear, I'm going to have to poke you again. Are you struggling in the vein? Yeah, but you just didn't want to give me any blood from it. Probably because it's all come out the bottom. Probably. My very first live broadcast was a game between um, Arsenal and Manchester United. A minute before we went on it, the director said in my earpiece, oh, we've just heard back. Audience around the world, 60 million viewers, John. Good luck, break a leg. 10, 9, eight, you're on air. Do you know what? I absolutely enjoyed it. One of those days when everything went right. We had the great George Best in the studio. He was brilliant, a great personality, and we had a drink afterwards. That was a start of a nice friendship. Surgeons have been called to assess how to give John the best chances of walking again. Hello, sir. Hello. Probably far too early to think at this point. Once one's soon done, do you have to look? In terms of walking, big toe is going to be the most important. In terms of a shot for a big, big toe, basically. Right. So hopefully enough of that. Well, there's every cloud and all that. George and I. We used to have some good gatherings. One Christmas, Errol Brown from Hot Chocolate was in there and leading the dancing on the dance floor. Did you have any sort of raucous evenings? Yeah, but I'm not talking about those. <laughs> With George's drinking, if somebody said to George, you should have something to eat, he wouldn't react very well to that. But if you'd say, you've got a bowl of chips, George, share some, you just have to, it's just the way you, you would deal with it. I was brought up with um, an alcoholic father. And um, one thing you can never do is tell someone not to do something. Shirt scratch. When I was a child, on a Sunday, we'd, we'd go with Dad to the pub, and women and children used to stick outside, and it's the men inside. He'd be in with his, with his friends, with his mates, and um, there'd be in a group having a laugh and a joke, and you wouldn't see, you know, there was nothing going on that would make you think this isn't right. You know, it was only now, sort of being an adult myself, I realised they were all half cut, you know. <laughs> you don't realise that at the time. I remember once seeing my dad with a black eye, and which was so unusual. For me, that was the first indication that, that something wasn't quite right. Right, sharp scratch. Again. Again. One day, I remember my mum um, telling us that, that she and dad um, uh, were no longer going to be married. Um, she didn't know when we'd see him again. We didn't see him for about two years. I didn't know why at the time. I remember being tearful and upset and I'm missing him. I do remember one time going in search of my dad and um, it was at night time and my brother and I were in our dressing gowns and slippers. We must have been seven and six, something like that. And I think we were walking towards the pub to see if we could find him in the pub. And a policeman stopping us saying, what are you what are you boys doing out and taking us back home? And I, I do remember saying I was just looking for my dad. Tried everything out. And then I must have been about, I don't know, eight, nine, getting the phone book and having this bright idea of searching for his name in the phone book. My brother and I, we just, like, picked up the phone. What did you say to him? Is that my dad? 
It's it's John. There was um, a silence on the other end of the phone. Take a seat, the queen when they're ready, okay. Got a fan here for you. Got a fan. Do you want one? I've got no, one here. I don't, I don't like that blowing on my on my face. No. <laughs> <laughs> They've had a baby. They've had a baby, no? Three-year-old Diego is in A&E with his parents after suffering a seizure at nursery school. Spain was on the peak of the recession, so like 2009. There were like 30% unemployment, and then I lost my job as a lawyer. Hi, Dad. Yeah, so, yeah, so he's just gone for, gone for a wee bit. Um, what we need to do is to recheck the observations and basically go from there. OK. We didn't have any hopes to find like a decent job in Spain. So the best option at that moment definitely was uh, coming in the UK. Since that day, we we have to like reinvent ourselves. Wow, Diego. Great. I will uh, let me grab some gloves, Mum, and I'll take that off your hands. I obviously couldn't do nothing with my law degree. English law is completely different. I'm not a snob. I'm not afraid to, to work if I have to. You know, having a kid in here with no family support, with the prices of the childcare, that was a really scary thing. We start from the very bottom at the beginning. <laughs> My first job was a waiter in a restaurant, basically running food from the kitchen to the floor. When I was not running the food, I was like polishing plate with water and vinegar, polishing the cutlery, cleaning the glasses. It was a tough job, I mean, it's a physical job, but at the same time it was something new for me as well. In a different country, in a different language. After a couple of years, we make a home of this, uh, this city. Yeah. So urine, urine was negative, OK? Yeah. So there's no sign of any infection or anything like okay. that, so that's great. If the fever carries on more than five days, or you just think that you're not happy that he's not, you know, not, not getting yeah. better, yeah. Then, then bring him back in, a, you know, three or four days' time for a review. But um, otherwise, it should all just, you know, as long as we keep on top of the temperature, oh. yeah. um, he should be OK. But cool. So uh, do you want to come with me, guys, and I'll take you out? That's all. There we go. If you come with me, young man. Cool. There we go, guys. Thank you. That's all right. No worries at all. Like everyone, oh, you have bad days. You, you think that your life is, is, is a disaster and that you're frustrating because you, you have a degree and you're doing something you don't supposed to do. But at the same time, I'm positive in the way that I, I consider myself really, really, really lucky. I have food every day. I have a house, I have a lovely family. With Diego, the good thing is I spend a lot of time with him. So yeah, yeah, we have a, a close relationship. Like me and my father. I think they've so still not got a formal report yet. Doctors are awaiting the results of Mark's CT scan after he collided with the car and hit his head on the windscreen whilst out on a bank holiday. His wife, daughters and mother are at the hospital. All right. Perfect. What do you mean, what happened? Perfect. Great by right. It sounds like it was like a, a nine-seater, um, Maybe a minibus, I don't know. I don't remember it, Mum. 
You can't remember it? No. Do you know which side of the road you was on? Which no. where, where you was coming from? No. I think you've hit the windscreen with your head. When Mark was at the boarding school, he was 16. We was giving him the best possible chance that we could give him. It was a wonderful place. It was the time of his life. Everything had been hunky-dory, really, until that moment. Waiting on a, a, a doctor's report, really, and from this scan that you had done, mm. you'd be able to see more then, if you've done anything. Mark's father and I were married for about 27 years. We had a wonderful time. We did everything together. One evening, my husband and I sat down to watch television, and um, he just said, out of the blue, I've been to a solicitor about a divorce. I said, am I hearing you right? Yes, he said, I've looked at my life. I feel I've got 25 good years left in me to be out there doing things. I said, doing what things? He didn't know quite what to say. So I'm saying to him, well, something must have happened. You know, I just wanted the ground to open up and disappear because um, divorce in my family was like a dirty word. Would you rather not talk? Years for the rest of sleep it off. Mm. It's just so. Mark at that time didn't know anything about it, and I actually told him one Sunday morning that his father had asked for a divorce. And all his reaction was, don't say any more. Don't tell me any more. One minute, Mark's father and I both going down to meet him or to watch the match on the Saturday, and then suddenly it was just me. Just me going. Yeah. It had an immense impact on Mark's life. And a lot of his problems lie within himself. He looked up to his father, Mark, as a, as a footballing person. I think Mark, in his own mind, thought, I'm never going to make this now. Do you want me to sing you a lullaby? No, no right. <laughs> When he left boarding school, he drifted, basically. He went out to North America to become a ski instructor. He had an accident while he was out there. And he said he couldn't have cared less whether it killed him or not. Hi. Hi. The full results of Mark's CT scan have arrived. So he looks like he's got quite a big horizontal fracture from his parietal bone okay. through the squamous and into the greater wing of sphenoid. There's a bleed underlying it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks. The bleeding on the brain can be very serious. It has very varying degrees. You can have very small bleeds on the brain, which people can make a full recovery from, but there are very serious bleeds on the brain which can lead to ongoing disability. more duty for the next while. It won't be me. Do you live alone or do you live with someone? No, I live with my family. Oh, grand. John is awaiting a decision on whether doctors can repair the damage to his foot. Can I ask you to do a favour? Go for it. My, this earlobe on this side. Yeah. Just give it a quick scratch. I can't this reach side. it. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I'm just got a bit of an itch there. Is that okay? done, that's done. Okay, Thank you. Grand. Sorry about that. That's all right. It was just so surreal, getting the phone book and searching for my dad. There weren't that many Warrington, so I think we found him on the second dial. My brother and I, we just passed the phone to each other. 
and then it all came out, you know, it was great. We were talking, how are you? And after that, I think that's what helped instigate some sort of access arrangement. He never stopped drinking. You know, you could see that physically he'd been ravaged by drink, but he never, never, as far as I can recall, never saw him drunk. I tell you what, can you do the operation? You're the only person who's ever managed to give me a painless injection. Uh, now I know you're winding me up. <laughs> We'd see him every week, lovely Sunday lunches. Then we'd go for a walk in the park, and he'd try and take... He'd always bring a blooming rugby ball instead of a football to try and get us to play rugby. I remember that. Then as we got older and we, we became more independent, then we'd, then we'd go and see him or we'd spend weekends with him. They're all just happy memories. Hello. Uh, let's go through one of the orthopedic consultants. <laughs> orthopedic doctors have been called to assess John's foot ahead of surgery. I just want to check a couple of little things. Can you feel me touching this toe? Yeah. I, I don't think that there's going to be any specific reattachment. And so I might have to shorten it back down to almost back down to there in order to get oh, the skin really? in place. Yeah, yeah, because some of that skin around the edge of there might not be too healthy. So you might have to take away a little bit of skin as well. I'm not going to remove anything that's not going to be of any use to you and try and keep everything else, that's the plan. I was 29, 30, and was at a family wedding, and I would probably perhaps be on my guard a little bit because of my dad, and just telling him, no, you're not having any more to drink for a while, you can have a rest, you can have something to eat, you know. I, I was perhaps nannying him, uh, and he didn't take kindly to that, so we had a row and we stopped talking to each other. And the day after, I was doing some work in New York. I'd gone back to New York for a couple of months. When I got back, I phoned through to my mum to say, I'm back, I've landed. And um, I just remember um, having news down the phone that, you know, your dad's dead, you know, your dad's died. Blood poisoning caused by a burst ulcer. Um, he died totally alone. I would have loved to have had one last conversation with him to say, I'm sorry, or I love you, but I never had that chance. They need the results, and the police need the results, because they've got the road closed at the moment. Mark has suffered a serious head injury after being hit by a car. Doctors are awaiting the full report following his CT scan. Oh, you all right now? You all right, Mark? Yeah, you all right? Yeah, I don't know how long I can hold myself. Hello, Mark. You all right? The CT report has come up. Mm -hmm. He got bleed in your brain. OK. He also got a, a skull fracture, OK? OK. So we will observe you. Mm -hmm. OK. I'm just going to refer you to the neurosurgeons... OK. ..to get their opinion of you. OK. Can I please? It's going to be fine, honey. I feel fine. Stay still. Stay still. Don't move. It's going to be fine, honey. That's it. Do what you got to do. The divorce, it had an immense impact on Mark's life. He never spoke about it. And I think he's lived with that for all these years. He had these footballing dreams that never transformed into anything. 
and he couldn't get over the fact that he never made it, basically. So, Evelina, come on, come on, come on. It's going to be fine, honey. I feel breath. fine. Yeah. Right. Listen, I'm going to be fine. I've got a good side of the going to be all right. Right, put your head between your knees. And then absolutely everything changed. He sort of met Evelina, and she was a very good influence on him. He started doing a proper job, and they started a family together, and he never looked back after that. We're going to be on the move now, then, yes, are we? Yes, we're going to be on the move now, man. That's super. He was a good dad. He would help out with the girls, and um, he, he would change the nappies and feed them. He's got this great connection with them. For Mark, it's always been important to be a part of the family because for him, his family broke. Mum and dad parted and it was very difficult. So when he finally had his own children, he was very proud. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Mark will be kept under observation whilst neurosurgeons decide how to treat the bleed on his brain. Right, let me just put some gel in it on it. You're going to go up to pee, sure. Okay? Doctors are preparing to operate on John's foot in an attempt to give him the best chance of being able to walk again. Sorry, I didn't feel anything. I'm just anticipating... What's going to happen, yeah? Yeah, pain. It was literally Christmas time when he passed away, and funny enough, he always sent a card, and he was never emotional. And I remember that year, he actually wrote some words in it, and that was so unlike him. And I can remember them to this day. To my darling eldest child, winter will soon be upon us, but you forever be a harbinger of spring to me. If I'd known what was going to happen, then then I would have, I would have liked to have asked him more about him, his life, to see if I could, you know, to help him, to see if there was a way to help him. But you can't have regrets, things happen. Right, we'll go up to X-ray, right? right? Thank you. OK. Do I think my dad would be proud of me? I would hope so. I really hope so. I think of the things I've achieved in my life and in my work, I would hope so. My toes were absolutely unsavable. I thought, I've hit the bottom. I'm never going to walk again. <laughs> the next weekend after the accident, it was a beautiful morning, and, and then suddenly, one by one, I heard all these different lawnmowers firing up and I felt shivers. There was a knot in my stomach. It did bring it all back, and I thought, there's only one way I'm going to conquer this. Otherwise, I think it would have ended up being some sort of um, phobia. It looks like a pig's trotter. That's my new nickname, Rodney Trotter. Rodney for being a plonker for doing it in the first place. Trotter, because it now looks like a pigfoot. Something like that happens. And it does make you realise life's so short. 
be taken away in a split second. scary at the time, but they, they ended up there or, or why you're there. It's one of those moments you think, well, I'm just lucky to be here by the sounds of it. Oh, so I put my whole life into football. And you think, well, why have I done my whole life doing this and not getting anything back out of it? But then I can still transfer my other energy into coaching the football. I would love my young lads to make it and play for England one day. And then come back to me and say, you were my first coach. That'd be a lovely thing to see. Thank you.